Good evening, and welcome to Hard Fire. I'm your host, Joseph Dobrian, and I'm bringing you another half hour of conversation and current events from a libertarian perspective. Now, uh, our guest tonight, all the way from Washington, D.C., is Dr. Stephen Baskerville, who has come out with a new book called Taken Into Custody, The War Against Fathers, Children, a Father's Marriage, and the Family. Dr. Baskerville, welcome. Thank you. And tell me about your book. Um, is there really a war on fathers, marriage, and the family? And if so, how does your book describe it? Well, very much so. Uh, and it's a very multifaceted war. I concentrate, for the most part, on what takes place through the divorce machinery. Uh, many people have a very um, uh, inaccurate view of what divorce is in this country, as two people mutually agreeing uh, to end their marriage. More often, it's a power grab by one spouse and by the government. Well, often that takes place because uh, of the um, legal procedures involved, correct? That's right. Um, the legal industry is essentially a, a, a massive machine uh, that not only favors divorce, but actually imposes it on unwilling people uh, against their will. Can you explain how that is the case? How, how, can, um, how can the legal system impose divorce on people who don't wish to be divorced? Well, since the advent of no-fault divorce, which is really unilateral, uh, or involuntary divorce, one spouse uh, with the aid of the government machinery can unilaterally divorce the other spouse. Uh, but it's even more serious than that. Uh, the involuntarily divorced spouse can be thrown out of their home. Uh, their, their rights, their movements, their finances are controlled from that point by the court and by the government. And perhaps most serious of all, their relationship with their children is controlled. Uh, they can be cut off from their children completely. Their visitation with their children is tightly regulated. They can be forced to pay extortionate amounts of money ostensibly for the maintenance and upkeep of their children in the form of child support. Uh, they can be shaken down for legal fees of lawyers and psychotherapists they have not hired. Essentially through involuntary divorce, the government seizes control of your private life, uh, and uh, including your finances, your relationship with your children, even your movements. Okay, now you say that this is a war against fathers. Uh, doesn't it affect mothers pretty badly as well, or is it mostly fathers? It can in many instances. Uh, today the most serious weapon in the divorce arsenal is children. Uh, it is children that are the main, the main uh, battleground, the fights over child custody, the, the child support, uh, alleged domestic violence accusations and child abuse accusations for purposes of obtaining custody. Children have become the weapons, and most often children are the weapons of mothers, of women. Uh, but it's not always the case. Uh, the genders can be reversed. Uh, there are many instances where fathers use the children against the, uh, against the mothers as well. But okay. overwhelmingly, the crisis that we hear so much about of fatherless children is not fathers deserting their families at all. It's more often fathers, fathers being voluntar involuntarily ejected from their family by family courts. Well, one hears this a great deal, and one hears of um, children being played off by, uh, by uh, one or the other or both parents. Um, but is this actually encouraged by the legal industry or by the government, or is this just something that people do when they're divorcing because they get nasty with each other? No, no, it's very much uh, not only encouraged, but made almost unavoidable by the government. Uh, the courts effectively side with the parent that creates litigation for them. The court sides with the parent that wants to divorce, that wants to seize unilateral sole custody of the children. Uh, this creates business for the court. It creates earnings for lawyers, for forensic psychotherapists, for social workers, for a huge entourage of uh, clients, patronage clients. Uh, that exist at the, at, the, at the bidding of the judge, for the most part. So the judge has a financial and, and political incentive to encourage as much divorce as possible, and therefore to side with the party that is most belligerent, that wants the divorce, that wants sole custody of the children. Okay, uh, but, so does that mean that if, uh, if my wife and I are getting divorced and uh, there's no hard feelings between us and we want to keep it as simple and as painless and as amicable as possible, then we will be discouraged from doing that? Not necessarily. If there's genuine goodwill and there's genuine, uh, you know, bilateral um, uh, relations and, and amicability, then, then it is possible. But very few divorces are that way. Actually, about 80% of divorces in this country are unilateral. They are over the objection of one spouse. It's more often uh, one spouse uh, in a power grab, where he or more often she seizes the children, uh, then either, either departs with the children, flees, goes to somebody else, to a parent's house or a sister's house or a a domestic violence shelter uh, alleges trumped up charges about, about domestic violence or child abuse against the other spouse, uh, seizes sole control of the children, uses the children as weapons to extract 
uh, child support and, uh, and other uh, forms of, of payment. Okay, uh, now let me play devil's advocate for a moment. You bring up the question of spousal abuse, mm -hmm. and in some cases I dare say that that is concocted, but I would guess that in large part it's absolutely true, and uh, the spouse does have to uh, run out of the house, sometimes taking the children along, and seek refuge um, with another relative or in a shelter or something like that. In that case, it seems to me that a unilateral divorce action might sometimes be inevitable. Um, isn't that the case? That is the case in very few, few instances. In fact, there is overwhelming evidence, and quite a number of scholars have documented this, that uh, trumped-up accusations of spousal abuse and child abuse are now out of control in this country. They are made without uh, any uh, due process of law, without any in introduction of any uh, forensic evidence into the court, without any formal charge in most instances. The uh, accused spouse is summarily evicted from the home, cut off from all contact with his or her children, uh, usually his children, and uh, ordered to make child support payments. And uh, this, is, this is very well known. The courts don't even pretend otherwise. Uh, this, this is, uh, in fact, we can show you documentation that shows that most do domestic violence hysteria and accusations are directly connected with questions of divorce and child custody. Okay. So what sorts of solutions do you propose for this situation? Well, there's a number of things. We need to restore due process of law to the divorce proceedings. Uh, accusations should be made only with, uh, with evidence. There should be formal charges. There should be uh, criminal charges when there is domestic violence or, or child abuse alleged. And, sh and there should be criminal protections as well for the accused, due process protections. Um, there should also be a, a presumption of shared parenting in the case of divorce or unwed childbearing where all else being equal, uh, parents share custody of the children rather than fighting over them. Uh, there should also be, there's a very old body of parental rights, of guarantees for the rights of parents to the care and custody of their children, which has been basically overturned over the last um, 20 or 30, 40 years. Well, what uh, are some of those rights that are no longer enforced? Well, there's a, a very ancient body of precedents going back to the English common law, in fact, saying that parents have a, have a liberty interest in, in the care and custody and, and raising of their children. Uh, and uh, a, huge, a, a large body of precedent going back decades, if not centuries. And these uh, precedents need to be enforced. Uh, instead, what we have is the substitution of a, of a standard known as the best interest of the child, whereby courts and other government officials can substitute their judgment of what is in the best interest of other people's children, children they don't even know in most instances, over the rights, the fundamental liberty interest rights of parents to raise their own children as they see fit. Okay. Uh, I, I'm a pretty old man now, and I can remember back in the uh, 1960s when people got divorced, Custody was almost automatically awarded to the mother with very limited visitation rights for the father. And then it seemed like in the uh, 1970s and 80s there was a shift more towards shared custody and uh, or perhaps it was easier for the uh, father to gain sole custody if he were the, uh, the proper parent to have it. Now are we seeing a shift back to uh, what we saw in the 1950s and 60s when custody was almost automatically the mother's? I'm not sure there's ever actually been a, a true shift. There has been no, there are no hard figures on this. The courts refuse to compile uh, figures on, on which uh, gender, which parent gets custody of the children. But even if fathers are getting custody more often, this is not necessarily a good sign. It could simply mean that fathers are using the courts against mothers more successfully. Uh, a presumption of both parents being equally involved in the lives of children is, is much healthier than allowing one parent to unilaterally depart and throw the other parent out of the family and out of the lives of the children. So uh, I'm not convinced that there is a, uh, a shift in favor of fathers. If there is, it's not necessarily uh, the way it should be, not necessarily healthy uh, any more so than a, a shift in favor of mothers. Okay, uh, then well, in your opinion, what should the burden of proof be? Um, if, uh, if one parent says that the other parent is abusive in some way or dangerous in some way, what standards of proof have got to be met in your opinion? Well, that parent should have, you're right, that parent should have a burden of proof to prove that the other parent is unfit before set, separating that parent from his or her children. Uh, child abuse is a crime. Uh, spousal abuse is a crime. And we have laws uh, in, against uh, a violent assault in, as far as I know, every jurisdiction in this country. If you simply adjudicated domestic violence and child abuse as violent assault, like any other crime, with due process protections for the accused, uh, this would solve the problem. Unfortunately, these, these, these alleged offenses have blurred the distinction between private behavior, which is legal, and criminal behavior, which of course is illegal. Uh, what we need is a, is, a, is a categorical distinction between private behavior and crime. 
in the home as we have anywhere else. Okay. Now, you uh, to go to the title of your book, Taken Into Custody, um, does this refer to the um, state occasionally taking over the, uh, the custody of children? Is that treated in your book at all? Well, yes, that is part of it. It's, it's, it's effectively, during divorce, children do become wards of the state. Custody goes to the ch uh, of the children effectively, resides not with the mother or the father, but with the state. But it also refers to the criminalization of parents. Uh, during, as a res result of the divorce process and, and other uh, government actions, parents are criminalized. Innocent, law-abiding parents who have done nothing wrong are criminalized. Their contact with their chil children uh, is a criminal act. They are liable to arrest uh, for trying to see their own children. They are liable to arrest for being in their own homes if they're accused of spousal or child abuse. They are liable to arrest if they cannot make extortionate child support payments, which may be way beyond their means and which they may have done nothing to incur. So the taken children are taken into custody by the divorce machine, but the parents are also criminalized. They're also taken into custody uh, by the divorce machinery. This is a very serious violation of civil liberties and civil rights in this country. I believe it is the most serious violation of civil rights in America today. Okay, if you are in a situation where you are afraid that uh, a divorce may be impending and that you may be put through the mill in this way, what steps can you take proactively to, uh, to minimize the damage when and if it happens? That's a good question, and I don't really have a good answer for, this, for that. Uh, there is really very little you can do. Uh, one uh, line of thought, of course, is that the best protection parents have from this is simply not to have children in the first place. That's what Attorney Jed Abraham writes in his book. The other Well, it looks like I'm on the right track anyway. Well, the other solution is even more frightening. Uh, one line of, another line of thought says that the best defense is an offense, that if you grab the children and run away first, you are most likely to prevail. The, the judge will give you custody temporarily, which is effectively permanent. The judge will give you uh, child, child support uh, and other monetary windfalls. So it's a, a kind of race to the courtroom, like the old race, nuclear race to the trigger. Whoever snatches first survives. Is that so? I had no idea. So in other words, if I'm married and I suspect that my wife is about to leave me for somebody who's richer, handsomer, and cooler, why then my uh, smartest move would be to uh, pack the kids into the car and fill them up with a Happy Meal or two and uh, drive them over to my parents' place. Well, I'm certainly not advocating that, but the logic of the divorce system today means that, logically speaking, that is precisely, that is probably your best defense, yes. Oh, dear. So, <laughs> what can be done about that? Uh, what can be done is we need to change the laws and the procedures governing divorce and child custody immediately. Uh, psychotherapeutic remedies, feel-good talk about uh, reconcile, reconciliation, about mediation, about counseling, uh, and these sorts of things, these are pretty much worthless. Okay, but these changes in the law that you speak of, they all have to be done at the state level, am I right? Well, yes. Uh, custody and, and divorce law do, do pertain to the state level, and any laws in, the, in, the, in divorce or in, uh, in custody, such as shared parenting, would be most appropriate at the state level. But there are federal law, federal precedents, again, for parents' rights to the care and custody of their children. So you could envision that there, are, there is a body of constitutional, federal constitutional case law, which would give federal courts the uh, jurisdiction not to uh, change custody law to determine custody, but to guarantee the rights of parents and their children not to be separated without due process of law. Okay. Unfortunately, the federal courts refuse to get involved in this, arbitrarily claiming that they have no jurisdiction in domestic, uh, in domestic uh, relations cases. Okay. Well, now, on that note, I'm going to uh, cut away from you for just a half a moment to remind our viewers that um, this uh, show is sponsored in part by the uh, Libertarian Party of New York. And here in New York City, uh, you can go to the website of the Manhattan chapter of the Libertarian Party at www.manhattanlp.org. And there you will find links to other libertarian websites. You'll find uh, basic information about the Libertarian Party and about libertarian thought and philosophy. And from there, we might just uh, convert you after all. Once again, that website is www.manhattanlp.org. And uh, we are back once again with Dr. Stephen Baskerville, the author of Taken Into Custody. The war against fathers, family, the family, against fathers, marriage, and the family. 
Now, uh, you mentioned at the top of the program, Dr. Baskerville, that um, in some ways the government would actually prefer that married people be divorced rather than stay married. Did you really mean that, or did I misunderstand you? I don't think there's any question about that. Uh, G.K. Chesterton once said that the, uh, the family in marriage is the main rival to the state's power, the main check on the power of the state. And uh, what we've seen in the last few decades, if not longer, is a steady move of courts, uh, social service bureaucracies, and, and, and other government agencies to forcibly break up families, to encourage divorce, to encourage fatherless and, and parentless children in many cases, um, to create trumped up charges of domestic violence, of child abuse, to do anything to sever the relationship both between spouses and between uh, parents and children. Okay, well it is true that uh, divorce rates have risen dramatically in the past half century and so have illegitimacy rates. But uh, you suggest that this is done um, with the complete approval of, of the government, that they like to see this happen, correct? Well, I can't say the state of mind, but this is certainly being, the instrument of this is certainly the government, absolutely. This is not a spontaneous problem of spouses deciding to part ways. This is definitely a power grab, which one spouse usually perpetrates with the assistance of courts, lawyers, psychotherapists, social workers, and other uh, agents of the state, yes. Okay, well, I would have to agree with you because I've seen it myself. Do you have experience with this, Dr. Baskerville? Have you been through the divorce process yourself? I have been through family courts, yes. I've okay. seen these courts from the inside. Have you children of your own? Yes, I do have two children. Okay, and uh, what was your experience with the family courts? Any anecdotes you'd like to share with us? Well, um, you really have to see these courts in person almost to believe what goes on. I was uh, summoned to court on a few hours' notice. My children were abducted from my home. I was summoned to court on a few hours' notice. I was stripped of the right to see my children. I was told I had no right to see my children except what my spouse uh, uh, allowed, permitted. I was told to make child support payments of two-thirds of my salary, about $1,200 a month. I was left with about $900 a month of disposable income to live on and support two children. Uh, I have, have been stripped of any right to make any decisions about my children. And um, unfortunately, this is, this is not unusual at all. This is fairly typical. Um, typical scenario. So you hadn't done anything as far as you know to uh, provoke this type of action? At no time have I been accused of any legal wrongdoing, either criminal or civil. That's exactly right. Uh, it's not necessary f to be accused of any, any wrongdoing whatsoever. Now, I, uh, private, private uh, imperfections are another matter, but our system of due process of law is supposed to be based on recognized criminal or civil wrongdoing, not human imperfection. And in my case, and in the vast majority of cases, uh, and we can document this, there is no even allegation, or let alone proof or conviction, of civil or criminal wrongdoing for the parent to be stripped of their children and their, uh, their private lives effectively criminalized. Well, have, has the situation been resolved to any degree? In my case? Yes. No, it hasn't. It's never resolved, really, until the children are, are grown. Uh, if I try to see my children when I'm not authorized by the court, I will be liable to arrest. If I cannot pay two-thirds of my income every month uh, in child support, I will be liable to arrest. If I go near my children, uh, if I'm accused of domestic violence or child abuse and I fail to vacate my home, I will be subject to arrest. Uh, this is the reality that millions of Americans live with today. Well, um, in retrospect, is there anything you could have done differently to, uh, to spare yourself this type of um, financial and, um, and personal ruin? Uh, in many cases, no. And I was living in a foreign country. I could have uh, stayed in a foreign country and, 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 and never returned to the United States. But that was an unusual case. I, uh, most people do not have that option. Uh, I could have stayed in, in where I was living in Europe uh, and avoided any uh, uh, subjecting myself to the jurisdiction of American family courts. Uh, I chose not to. I chose to return to this country to be with my children when they were kidnapped and, and brought to the United States. Oh, dear. Well, are there any organizations uh, anywhere in the United States that uh, you can go to for support, for advice, for uh, practical uh, intervention? Well, our organization, the American Coalition for Fathers and Children, is a, consists of a network of, of groups throughout the country. Most groups working on this are local. Our affiliates are local. We have affiliates in many states throughout the country. If you go to our website, acfc.org, you will find a, a list of local affiliate organizations. Uh, acfc.org? acfc.org, the American Coalition for Fathers and Children. Okay. Um, so, uh, the... Uh, apparent um, idea behind this is that uh, fathers get, generally speaking, far the worse of it than mothers. And um, from my own observation, 
that appears to be the case. But uh, do you occasionally work with um, with mothers or with uh, organizations that uh, advocate for parents of either sex? Yes, most of our local affiliates, in fact, do advocate for uh, non-custodial parents of, of either sex. In fact, one local group I know in New Jersey will tell you that about 50 percent but they have many cases of non-custodial mothers going through the same injustice. And they will tell you that about half of those mothers have former spouses who are in some way connected with the judiciary, either as lawyers or judges or uh, enforcement officials of some kind or social workers. Okay. And that confirms, I think, my theory that much of this is, uh, is politically driven. Uh, fathers who have connections with the legal industry can often turn the tables and uh, inflict the same injustice on mothers that many mothers inflict on fathers. Okay, I dare say that's the case. Another question I'm curious about is we hear so much now these days about the subject of gay marriage or civil unions between persons of the same sex. Does that complicate matters with regard to, uh, to child custody? It certainly does uh, complicate things. Now, how, we, how that's going to work out in the long run is, uh, is difficult to say. But it's interesting to note that uh, I believe uh, I've written and I believe I can prove that much of the controversy over same-sex marriage and same-sex adoptions has, come, has proceeded directly out of the controversy with divorce. Uh, in other words, the desire of great gay couples to marry, uh, to adopt children, and so forth, largely proceeds from the way that heterosexual marriage has broken down uh, under the pressure of the divorce industry. Uh, I can show you quotations from advocates of gay marriage who will tell you that the only reason they are interested in gay marriage is because of the way marriage has been debased uh, and degraded by homosexual, uh, by heterosexual groups through uh, the divorce process. So our failure to address this process of divorce and child custody among heterosexuals is what is leading to the breakdown of marriage in other areas of our society as well. Wait, let me see if I understand you correctly. Are you saying that uh, certain gay people are saying that because the state of marriage has been so degraded by heterosexual couples, they are now more eager to enter into such a contract because of what they might conceivably get out of the other person later on? Is that what you're suggesting? Yes, precisely. In fact, I can show you quotations from very prominent uh, gay rights advocates who will say, if you wish to go back to monogamous uh, heterosexual marriage of the 1950s where people were expected to stay married for life, if that's your definition of marriage, we're not interested. Uh, we're interested in marriage because it is uh, the economic benefits it provides for the most part, which is all that's really left of marriage, uh, thanks to the, uh, to the weakening of marriage by heterosexual couples uh, through divorce. Okay. So, um, in your opinion, what kind of a contract should we have? I mean, marriage, when you get right down to it, is a contract. In your opinion, what should that contract look like in order to uh, preserve the rights of both spouses and to preserve the well-being of the children, if any? Well, you're right. It is a contract, and there is a a clause in our Constitution saying that no state shall, uh, shall abrogate the, uh, the enforcement of contracts. And so it is, again, one instance of how modern divorce law is unconstitutional. It should be an enforceable contract. Uh, there should be penalties for the party that breaks it. Uh, there should be, if we want to legislate um, known grounds, in other words, uh, specific grounds which would permit a divorce, uh, as was once the case, then we should do that. But the point is that couples need to know, people need to know when they enter into this contract under what circumstances it can be abrogated, what are the likely consequences of having it abrogated, uh, and, and uh, understand that, that, that this is something which, which um, when they enter into it, they need to know the terms of it. What we've created instead is a bait and switch. People marry under the understanding that they are entering into an enforceable contract, and if they are unfaithful to it, there will be penalties. In fact, the penalties are almost always inflicted upon the, the, the spouse that is faithful to it. Okay, now you mentioned at the top of the program no-fault divorce, which you say is the whole big problem, and I'm inclined to believe you, but is no-fault divorce prevalent in every state of the Union or just in some? Effectively it is, uh, and I, would ha I don't want to blame no-fault divorce entirely because as many other developments took place at the same time. No-fault divorce is, a, is an indication of it, and uh, simply repealing it or changing no-fault divorce would, be a, would help. It would not be a panacea. Today, overwhelmingly, the battleground is children, and the pressing, urgent issue we must confront today is child custody. We must protect the parent-child bond. One way of doing that is protecting the rights of parents to the care and custody of their children. Another way is a presumption of ch all else being equal of shared parenting uh, of, of parents who do uh, divorce or, or separate. And then in 
some states you have common law marriage and in other states you do not. Does that complicate the issue as well? Not very much. Marriage has been so debased that it really doesn't matter whether you're married or not today. Uh, you can still be, uh, you can still suffer the same injustices as far as your children and as far as the finances, whether you're married or not. So in other words, if I, uh, if I were to impregnate a woman out of wedlock and uh, I suddenly got uh, angry at her and wanted to hurt her for some reason, I could take that child away from her even though I had not been living with her as a spouse or living as the father of that child. Is that right? As a man, it would be very difficult, but you could in theory do it, yes. The point is that marriage affords no protection. Uh, to, to fathers, uh, or to mothers either. Uh, there, you, a married father or mother has no more protection in divorce in, in family law today than an unmarried uh, parent does. Okay, so do you, uh, do you believe that maybe divorce should be made a little more difficult? Would that help matters at all? I believe that would help matters, yes. I believe there should be penalties and consequences for, for the spouse that, that, that abrogates the agreement, that breaks the contract. Um, but again, we, we need to address the custody issue because that is the urgent question today. That's what's leaving children fatherless. That's what's creating such havoc in our society today with this swarms of fatherless what children. What is the first step you would take then in order to alleviate the current custody situation? I would urge a presumption of shared parenting. Uh, where all else being equal, parents are share custody of their children, roughly equally share authority and time uh, with their children on a roughly 50-50 basis. Now, if there's fault, if there's abuse, if there's violence, uh, if there's problems, then, then there's leeway f for uh, one parent to have you know, uh, dominant uh, pro 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 preponderance of time or authority. But uh, all else being equal, parents should be treated equally, mothers and fathers, and they should share equally in the custody of their children. There would be specific criteria, benchmarks, burdens of proof, and so forth before one parent could be deprived of custody. Is that correct? Right, and they should be very clear. We can't have What we have now is a situation where judges determine subjectively uh, what is in the best interest of, of a child. Um, this usually ends up being what is in the best interest of the judge. To make the government the final arbiter of what's in the best interest of a child, in my opinion, and in most libertarians' opinion. On that note, we are going to have to say good night. But uh, Dr. Stephen Baskerville, thank you very much for being on the show. The title of your book, once again, is Taken into Custody, The War Against Fathers, Families, and Marriage. Dr. Ske Stephen Baskerville, thanks very much. Thank you. I am Joseph Dobrian. Join us another time for another edition of Hard Fire. Hard Fire is funded in part by the Libertarian Party of New York.